to a very special edition of the Short Circuit podcast. We are recording before the Supreme Court's long conference scheduled for September 26 on the topic of what the heck is Supreme Court up to. This includes the last term and the upcoming term. Our guests are Isha Nand and Jeff Fisher of the Stanford Supreme Court Litigation Clinic, who are best qualified to answer this question. And other questions, such as, how in the world does your clinic end up arguing so many cases each term? Isha and Jeff need no introduction. Isha has appeared on this podcast before. She's an assistant professor and co-director of the clinic. Prior to joining Stanford a year ago, she was a Supreme Court and appellate counsel at the MacArthur Justice Center, which is a frequent partner and collaborator of IJs on issues such as qualified immunity. Uh, Isha clerked for Justice Sonia Stamayor on the United States Supreme Court and for Judge Paul Watford on the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. Hey, Isha. Hi, Anya. So good to be back on the podcast. <laughs> Welcome back. Uh, Jeff is a professor of law at Stanford, a co-director of the clinic, and a special counsel at O'Melveny and Myers. He personally argued 46 cases before the United States Supreme Court, including Dubin versus United States, from the last term, which he will discuss today. Jeff clerked for Justice John Paul Stevens on the United States Supreme Court and for Stephen Reinhardt on the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. Hi, Jeff. Hi, it's great to be here. So I'd like to get us started by talking about the clinic, uh, and we can then transition to all the stuff you guys did at the Supreme Court last term and will be doing this term. Uh, Jeff, can you tell us more about the clinic, uh, how you operate, what's your record at the Supreme Court, all that kind of stuff? <laughs> okay, I'll do my best. <laughs> Uh, so the clinic, amazingly enough, is almost two decades old now. Uh, it started uh, as a pilot project with the idea of doing really two things. One is expanding Stanford's clinical program from an educational perspective, giving students uh, another uh, another way to research and write legal briefs and, and understand what it means to represent clients in real cases. Uh, just so happened to be cases in front of the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, so instead, of other, <laughs> <laughs> instead of other uh, tribunals or, or, or agencies or the like. Um, and the other piece of it is the lawyering piece, uh, which I think is probably best described as designed to level the playing field of representation in the Supreme Court, particularly when we started um, often... Um, uh, you know, governmental entities and corporations were particularly well represented in the court, and the same level of resources and expertise was not necessarily on the other side of the V. Uh, so the idea for the clinic was to provide pro bono co-counseling representation to level up uh, the representation, uh, if nothing else, on a resource standpoint uh, on the other side of the V. And so that's that's kind of our core mission, and that's really what we still primarily do. We do about half criminal cases where we represent criminal defendants, and about half civil cases primarily representing plaintiffs, but not always, but a variety of, uh, of, of, of issues that we cover on that side, everything from civil rights to consumer protection um, and you know, employment cases and lots of other things. Isha, uh, how do you uh, guys go about selecting cases? How do you think about uh, that? How do you approach it? So uh, I think we've got kind of a little bit of a sliding scale between the two considerations that Jeff listed, the kind of pedagogical piece and our public service mission. So on the public service front, um, as Jeff said, we care about bringing resources to the less resource side of the V, right? The immigrant, the criminal defendant, the individual facing off against a corporation or the government. Um, because we aren't representing a client at the Court of Appeals, we also have the luxury of thinking about public service kind of writ large. So not just is it a good idea for this client to go to the Supreme Court, but is it a good idea for the community of non-citizens writ large or the community of criminal defendants writ large for this case to go to the court? So, you know, you might have a situation where, you know, six circuits are siding with criminal defendants, one circuit's going the other direction, and actually kind of looking at the current court composition, it's pretty unlikely this court is going to rule in favor of the criminal defendant. Um, someone whose sole interest is in that criminal defendant might well decide uh, we should petition, right? Good chance the Supreme Court grants cert because there's a circuit conflict. Uh, some chance the criminal defendant is going to win. They don't have other options. We may not take that case because there's some likelihood that cert gets granted and we end up making bad law, not just for this one person, but for everyone else around the country that previously kind of had the benefit of the good law. So that's the kind of first piece, the kind of public service piece. Um, the second piece is the pedagogy piece. And a lot of this 
honestly boils down to logistics, right? We want cases that are timed such that students can really take the lead. Um, we want a mix of civil and criminal, of petitions and briefs and opposition, of merit stage and search stage work. Um, and most of all, we want co-counsel from whom our students can really learn and grow. So what is, um, if you were to break it down generally, how many petitions versus BIOs versus getting involved straight up at the merit stage? It's a good question. I think that our balance between petitions and briefs and oppositions has really shifted in recent years. Um, that is, given the kinds of clients that the clinic represents, we find ourselves more and more often trying to protect wins in the circuit courts from the Supreme Court. So yeah. basically saying, don't take this case. There's no circuit split. Exactly, exactly. So we wind up doing a lot more of that work. And you can imagine, um, you can perhaps think about why that is, given the current composition of the court. Um, but I'd say last year we did, um, uh, we, we did two merits cases and probably, I don't know, what would you say, Jeff? Um, uh, maybe eight or 10 projects that were at the petition stage, a mix of, of bios and and petitions? Yeah, that's probably about right. I, I would say over the over the sweep of the years, I think that for a long time I would have said we did about two-thirds petitions and one-third brief in opposition at, in the search stage. And that's gotten to be much closer to half and half now, if not maybe even tilted the last year or two in the, in the BIO direction. Um, and then we've averaged over the years, I think, five, four to six merits cases a term, but there's an ebb and flow to that. You know, when you do a lot of merits work, you don't have as much time to do new petitions. Right. And so, right. Uh, and then when you do those new petitions, you tend to <laughs> often, if you're successful, you get a lot of merits work. So there's a little bit of a up and down as that goes, you know, semester by semester, year by year. How many, uh, if you are respondent in the Supreme Court, uh, and it's kind of, it goes to this idea of it's good to be a petitioner because, you know, they grant it and chances are they want to reverse. Like, what is your record like when you are a petitioner versus when you are a respondent? Hmm, that's a great question that I do not know the answer to off the top of my head. We keep, we keep some records. Uh, and so I know that in the cases we've handled on the merits, we've run, we've won over 60% of those cases, um, uh, somewhere between 60% and two thirds of those cases. Um, I don't know, though, how that breaks down between petitioner and respondent off the top of my head. Um, one more question, uh, and that kind of uh, is about the clinic and how it's different from other Supreme Court clinics. Uh, there was, I think, one time where you actually, or maybe several times when you went against the, uh, another Supreme Court clinic, like a Texas Supreme Court clinic, right? Uh, but uh, how different are you from those clinics? Because they are proliferating now. Um, and how similar are you to those clinics? So, so I can say one kind of major difference between our clinic and I think almost every other clinic is we have the luxury of getting our students full time. So they're spending 40 or 50 hours a week on the drafting process. Um, and so it's not only that we have you know, truly incredible students that throw themselves into cases, they have no other commitments the quarter there with us. And so we really are able to create an entirely student led process, right? Um, Folks it's find their full-time it, job. It's their full-time job. That's right. And, and yeah. you know, people find it unbelievable. I found it unbelievable before I got here that, yeah. you know, second and third year law students would write every single word of a brief that gets filed at the United States Supreme Court. Um, but because we have, um, because we have the luxury of getting them full time, we're able to come up with a drafting process that enables them to do that. And I think we're unique among clinics for, for being able to have students without any other classes or commitments. Yeah, I think that's one thing. And then, and then the, the related thing, and I forgive us for doing a little bit of an infomercial for Stanford here. <laughs> That's what they're uh, here for. <laughs> but, um, but the other thing is, the, by way of faculty resources, we're different than the other clinics. Stanford uh, has invested in three full-time faculty members uh, now to be co-directors running the clinic. Um, I think most other law schools have at most one, uh, and they tend to be much more um, uh, driven by outside law firms helping, you know, in various ways uh, with those clinics. And so it's just a different model. Uh, and, and one thing about that is it allows us to be a little freer uh, in choosing our cases uh, and then in the way we, we, we resource them. Uh, and to circle back to the other question, yes, we have had a few cases over the years against other clinics. Uh, I think at least one against Texas, uh, one against Penn. Involving Fane Lozman, if I remember correctly. Right, right. That, one, was the, that was the floating home case. Yes. Um, 
years ago, we did a case, I believe, against the Penn Clinic when uh, J- now Judge Bebus was yeah. uh, was running that. Uh, and I think we had more recently a case against the Yale Clinic, uh, a First Amendment question. Um, and so we've yeah we've had a few of those, uh, and they're and and you know they're they're they're, they're fun um, I suppose, uh, and you can kind of um, laugh about maybe a budding rivalry there, but really it's just about representing the clients and uh, and 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 you know that's just another instance of having really good co- really good opposing counsel on the other side. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's now then uh, transition from the infomercial part of it, although just a little <laughs> bit still on it. Uh, <laughs> Jeff, uh, tell us what you have coming up this year. Uh, what, uh, what, what's on the docket? Okay, well, Isha, make sure I don't forget anything. Uh, so I guess most immediately we have four merits cases so far this term. All set four for... merits cases. Just let it sink in. <laughs> <laughs> all, just all, one term. All for this fall. All, so, half, so, term. <laughs> half term. Half <laughs> term. Uh, I told you there's an ebb and a flow. <laughs> uh, so uh, the very first one is going to be in the October sitting, um, uh, where uh, Isha's in the lead in a case called Murray versus UBS Securities. It involves the whistleblower uh, protections in the Sarbanes-Oxley Act. Yeah, the stuff that in law school they basically say, don't bother with it, it's too complicated. Mm. I don't know about that. Our story is it's pretty easy. Uh, so, but important, important uh, yeah. financial regulation uh, and employee rights at stake. Uh, then, in the second sitting of the term, uh, we have a case called O'Connor Ratliff versus Garnier, where we represent the respondents in that case, uh, where the Supreme Court is going to uh, consider whether public officials who have their own uh, Twitter or Facebook or other social media accounts. Uh, that are in one sense private, but in another sense branded as their official sites as in their in their public capacities, uh, are um, are subject to constitutional restraints. Uh, in other words, whether or not uh, they are state actors when they run those uh, social media sites. Um, and so our colleague Pam Carlin is going to be uh, arguing that case. Uh, then we have two cases that, w- that we understand will be scheduled for the December sitting. Uh, one is called Jackson against the United States. It involves the Armed Career Criminal Act, otherwise known as sort of the Full Employment Act for the Supreme Court. They seem to have t- one or two of those cases every term. Uh, but it's another one of these cases about whether uh, certain prior convictions qualify for the big mandatory minimum sentence that kicks in and for repeat offenders. And are you petitioner or respondent in that case? Uh, we represent petitioner in that case, uh, Mr. Jackson. So two petitioner uh, cases, one respondent, and what's the fourth one? Uh, the last one is we'll even things back out, so we'll go back to the respondent right. side. Uh, Garland <laughs> versus Singh, which is a case, uh, an immigration case. Again, Isha's, in, uh, uh, Isha's uh, in the lead for us in that case. Uh, and it involves uh, reopening immigration proceedings when, uh, when a uh, uh, removal order was issued uh, after somebody failed to appear. Did I get that generally right? That's exactly right. Yeah, yeah. okay. And so it's the, the <laughs> rules for getting those reopened. And Jackson, it's the case where the government said that the petition should be granted too, right? Yes. Yeah. So that's interesting where they are writing not a BIO, but they're writing... Yeah. Right. Well, there's two flavors of the government acquiescing to cert. Uh, one is sometimes the government comes in and says, uh, uh, you know, we think uh, we think the defendant is wrong or the other side is wrong, but we also but we but we agree that the U.S. Supreme Court should resolve this issue because there's a conflict over across the country and we just want to know what the what the rule is. Sometimes the government goes a step further and says we acquiesce to cert. Uh, because we think the other side is right, and we actually agree that a decision um, below was wrong. Um, uh, we have another project later in the clinic this term of cert petition where that's the situation, but in Jackson it's just the first situation where the government agreed uh, that the issue was cert worthy, even though they're on the other side of, uh, of us on the issue itself. Uh, do you kind of have an inkling that that's coming uh, when you file the petition? Or um, sometimes, yeah. Sometimes, if the split is really clear, yeah, uh, the government, as an institutional matter, uh, will agree with you. And so we've had that happen a variety of you know a handful of times over the years. We've also had a couple times b- big corporations uh, or other entities uh, acquiesce to cert just when they when they're national have a national perspective and just want to know the answer uh, to a question. Uh, and then to round out. The rest of our work, and I won't go through this in as much detail, uh, but we'll also be doing a few new cert petitions and, a, and, a, and at least one brief in opposition uh, this fall as well and uh, in a variety of cases. Yes, and we're going to mention one of them uh, that you guys already filed. Where we're collaborating with the fabulous folks at the Institute for Justice. What? 
<laughs> Say more about those guys. Uh, well, let's then uh, now talk about the Supreme Court itself and the cases um, that uh, it has in general and your particular cases. Isha, let's briefly talk about last term because, you know, there have been 1,000 podcasts on what happened last term. So we don't want to spend too much time on that. But one thing that I'm really interested in is your perspective on Justice Jackson because that's one thing that was very different <laughs> from other terms. We had a new justice, and she was very active. Uh, so tell us uh, kind of your opinion uh, of how she did and highlight uh, a couple of things for us. Uh, sure. So uh, how did she do? Um, I think incredibly, right? I think at sh you know she spoke more at oral argument than any other justice, which is kind of quite the feat for the most junior justice. Um, and I think some of the questions she posed at argument had a pretty seismic impact on the outcome of cases, right? I'm thinking in particular of her questioning in the Allen versus Milligan voting rights case, um, her hypotheticals in the affirmative action case about how colleges are to handle essay questions, um, hypotheticals to which, you know, I think the chief justice is responding to almost directly in kind of the closing page of his opinion. It, that's what universities are now uh, doing, right? They're like saying, okay, we can maybe do this through essays, uh, yeah. for example. And that's directly from Justice Jackson to Justice, Chief Justice Roberts that's to exactly now right. the actual policy. Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. And, um, and you know, I could, I could kind of go on. I mean, I think she's had a big impact on oral argument. Um, she's been really unafraid to stake her own position, right? So Adam Liptak writes that it took the chief more than 15 years to write a solo dissent. Justice Jackson has written three already in her first term, and she was equally full-throated in the kind of uh, quote-unquote shadow docket, speaking on behalf of capital defendants. Um, so she's definitely got a, a big voice on the court, and so maybe I'll highlight uh, three things that I think make her voice really unique. So the first one... Um, I'll highlight her kind of like burgeoning, like libertarianish alliance with Justice Gorsuch, right? So we see a lot of cases where the two of them are kind of out on a limb together. So in Bittner, this was a case about the Bank Secrecy Act. Um, Tyler, a case about the takings clause. We saw the pair of them kind of um, writing with no other justices joining them. Uh, so in the Bank Secrecy Act case, they were the only justices who would apply the rule of lenity, which is the kind of canon of construction we typically think of as applying to criminal statutes, um, to the civil penalties in that case. Um, and in the takings clause case, they were the only two justices who thought that the Eighth Amendment's excessive fines clause should come into play. So we see this sort of like shared suspicion of the government's power to wield punitive sanctions against individuals, and particularly the skepticism when the government tries to label those sanctions something other than punitive. So that's one is this kind of like libertarian streak. Um, second, she's kind of consistently taken her colleagues to task for their kind of uh, selective originalism that kind of ignores the second founding, that kind of mm -hmm. post-Civil War Reconstruction era. Dalewski, I'm thinking, the oral argument yep. there, right? Yes. She specifically talked about 14th Amendment originalism post-Civil War. Exactly. Look at the actual history of 1983. That was precisely what Congress was doing. It was a part, it, 1983, of the Ku Klux Klan Act, where Congress had looked at the situation of states not giving forum, not giving a cause of action to people who were being terrorized, and instead of adopting and incorporating those principles and saying, here's this new law and we're going to incorporate the common law of excluding you from the court, in fact, Congress created the right in order to allow people to go to court. Exactly. Yeah, that's exactly right. So she's really focused on this period of history that I think she sees her colleagues overlooking in their kind of historical analysis. And I think that's been a really p a powerful thing to have on the court. Um, and then I guess the final thing is, you know, I'll highlight her dissent in Jones versus Hendricks, which was the um, habeas case about where, you know, whether folks who are actually innocent of a crime can file a second habeas petition. Um she has this kind of interesting approach to statutory interpretation that I'm not sure I've seen somewhere else. It's sort of somewhere between the kind of, you know, Justice Kagan, we're all textualists now mode and then Justice Breyer, you know, text schmecks <laughs> starting point. Um, she sort of says in that dissent, she says, look, the majority is putting all this weight on these three words, but it turns out this part of the statute it was passed in the aftermath of the Oklahoma City bombing. It was, quote, rushed and emotionally charged. 
it's pretty obvious that this particular phrase was like a bad copy paste job, right? Like the Congress was trying to copy paste another portion of the statute. They forgot to change it for this Co- context. A little bit of a reality check, right? right? Like yeah. we can't forget that. Right. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, that there's some intuitive force to this idea that like, depending on whether the words of the, the you know, process of, a, you know, uh, came as a result of sort of haggling and legislative compromise and careful thought versus rushed, emotionally charged copy paste job, like maybe that should change the amount of weight that we put on those particular words. Um, so I think that's really interesting. And I don't think I can think of another justice who has a sort of similar model or approach on the court. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see what she does with this then this term, Jeff. Um, can you uh, highlight for us cases that are interesting that are coming up in addition to <laughs> the four, <laughs> the that four you most have. interesting cases that are coming up this term? Yeah. Uh, and, and, and maybe opportunity there for uh, the Gorsuch-Jackson uh, collaboration. Yeah. Well, I, I'll just say first real quick, I love that last point Isha made about Justice Jackson's point to statu- approach to statutory interpretation. It's really interesting. And the court itself is seems to be just getting more and more methodologically um, interesting and just attuned, like self-aware of its methodology lately. Uh, and in our clinic, I can't tell you how many statutory cases we've had over the years where the students going through the process, you know, really for most of them the first time of really doing a real case and a real issue, and 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 instead of kind of the debate in the classroom, we'll so we'll pause in the clinic and say, okay, wait a minute, does anyone actually think Congress considered this question for one <laughs> second? And they'll all say no. You know, no matter what their I, no matter right. what their perspective on statutory interpretation was or is, uh, uh, they all sort of the light bulb goes off. Now, what do you do about that? Is a whole different set of set of things, but I love that point. Yeah, and we will talk a little bit more about this when you talk about Dubin, because sure. that's a statutory interpretation case, and it's kind of, it reads very much like, do does Congress really think about the meaning of the word right. in relation to? Right, yeah, that's a great point, so we'll get to that. Uh, but so this term, you know, the court has about half of its docket set right now um, uh, with, with, with um, uh, you know, with plenty of big cases already on the docket and more perhaps to come. Uh, and, and so there's a lot one could talk about. I'll highlight two things, two, two substantive areas. Um, so the first is, uh, you know, big social media. Uh, I think, you know, the court took a case, took actually a pair of cases last term uh, to take its first hard look at big tech. I mean, we're sitting here in Silicon Valley, so it seems an appropriate <laughs> thing to talk about. Um, and, and basically kind of punted. Uh, they, they, they were, they were going to consider the scope of what's known as Section 230 immunity for tech companies. And you companies. would know about it because uh, Justice Alito asked you specifically about Section 230 during the oral argument. On <laughs> it's like, no fair. It's not my case. <laughs> uh, so, um, so they were going to consider the scope of tech companies' uh, Section 230 immunity from publishing you know, via their platforms uh, comments that other people make, uh, and the basic argument there is: Look, we're not the we're not the we're not the content creator here. We're just the, the 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 technological platform on which it's being spoken. So we shouldn't be held liable. Now, as I said, the court basically decided as a predicate matter that the cause of action was faulty in those cases, and so didn't get to the immunity from the cause of action. Um, but now the court is poised to take up. Uh, I'll call it two cases, it's really two issues this term. Now, neither of them are officially on the docket yet, uh, but I think one, if not both, are very highly likely to be. So one is a pair of laws from Texas and Florida uh, that require um, uh, social media and tech platforms to to refrain from, I think, what the law views as censoring conservative speech on issues of public concern. Um, and uh, the 11th and 5th circuits have split on whether those laws are constitutional or not. The government agrees. Uh, the federal government, which the court somewhat curiously asked for its perspective, agreed that the court should grant certain decide the case. So that's going to be a big deal. Um, and then and then also we have just in recent days uh, the, this case coming out of the 5th circuit restraining the Biden administration from uh, – interacting or maybe negotiating with tech platforms about content about things like COVID policy and the like and misinformation. So you have this 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 wave of, I think, this conservative critique that the platforms tilt left and are censoring conservative speech. And the interesting thing as this comes to the court is not just that, you know, 
these are more and more the mediums of our lives and society and democracy, so that's a big deal. Uh, but also the tech companies argument in these cases is going to be kind of the inverse of what they said last term. They're going to be like, we're publishers here. We're entitled <laughs> to First Amendment protection. You can't tell us what we put and put on our website. Now, you know, there are ways to thread that needle, but it's going to be kind of the upside down story given, yeah. given to the court. And so how the justices react to just the um, the business behavior and the importance of this in and uh, of these platforms in our society right now and the constitutional implications, I think are gonna be big and interesting. Um, the other case I'll mention is uh, the Rahimi case that uh, I'm sure listeners uh, for the most part are already aware of, but this is the court's uh, newest, newest foray back into the Second Amendment. This case is already on the docket. It will be argued in November. And the question is whether the federal law restricting the possession of firearms uh, from people who have domestic violence restraining orders uh, is constitutional. Is How about drug uh, drug users? Uh, well, that's another, <laughs> maybe for another day. Yeah. Uh, but the thing that's, uh, you know, I, I find the Second Amendment um, issue really, um, and I mean writ large, really interesting. You know, with, with Roe v. Wade falling by the wayside, um, you know, that was sort of the, 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 the target for the for the for the conservative movement uh, for a generation or two generations right. with the court, it really helped them organize. And, and, and so the yeah. left hasn't really galvanized around a single issue that it feels is a target. You know, on the other going the other direction, yeah. where democracy, where democratic choices are being restrained by the Supreme Court's interpretation of the Constitution, and if the court takes this next step in the Second Amendment to say not just so-called law-abiding citizens, you know, who ha who have no mental illness or the rest can possess guns, but also people with domestic violence restraining orders that might be more of a threat to society. I wonder if at some point um, that that there's sort of a galvanizing that occurs uh, around that issue. Now, there's a lot of ifs baked into that, what the court does in, on the issue in the first place, and then probably political judgments that I'm not equipped to make. But I do think it's a really, really potentially explosive case for the Supreme Court. We talked about this case on Short Circuit. Uh, we had a live panel. And... Um, specifically on this. And the reasoning that it, it, it's this idea that you're looking at, you know, the Second Amendment at the time of the founding and what the restrictions were at the time, right? And it's just, you can't help but when you read it to, it's kind of like Justice Stevens, you know, dissent in Heller, right? Where the, you can muster arguments on both sides. So the methodology is very complicated when you're thinking, you know, here's an argument on one side, here's an argument on the other side. Pick the one that you find, like, you know, the government provided five different originalist arguments in Rahimi, in the Fifth Circuit. And the panel did not like any one of the fives and provided its own for the other side. So it would be interesting to see if the court would try to maybe have a little bit more um, constraint on how this method actually works, because Rahimi seems to be an illustration of how right, it actually right. doesn't. And that brings us back to methodology. I mean, I think the defenders of Heller and that line of cases would say, well, they're completely different than Roe, even though they're both explosive um, ideological issues. You know, this is grounded in the, in the text of the Constitution, unlike Roe is. Um, but it doesn't take very long, even if you accept, you know, Heller itself obviously it was a matter of a lot of debate about the text of the Second Amendment. But right. even if you get past that, the methodology of history and tradition that the court says is so easily, you know, at least cabins judicial discretion, um, very quickly runs out. Uh, and so just in the Rahimi case, just a glance at the briefs, you know, gives you one example, which is that the defendant in that case says, well, you can't restrict my possession of a firearm because there weren't even domestic violence laws at the time of the founding. So how on earth could I be restricted from possessing a gun based on a domestic violence restraining order that didn't even exist? Those didn't even exist at the time of the founding. And the government comes back and says, well, wait a minute, if, if you're going to look at history, that carefully, yeah. uh, or maybe I should say, you know, that, that specifically, um, all the guns you want to own weren't, weren't in, <laughs> weren't, weren't in op creation right. at the right. time of the founding they were either. Yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. So, uh, so there are, let's just say limitations on the constitutional methodology there that will be interesting to see how the court deals with. Yeah. And Isha, to your point about Justice Jackson and kind of her originalism, it'll be interesting to see what she brings to this discussion and how she would approach the question. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's right. I think that she's got her eye trained on a broader sweep of history, and so it'd be interesting to see what she unearths. 
All right. All right. Let's now get to uh, the meat of this podcast recording. And that's the two cases that you guys uh, argued last term. Uh, Isha, let's start with Glacier. Tell us uh, what the case is all about and uh, how did it turn out? Sure. So um, we represented a union that had organized concrete truck drivers to strike for better wages and working conditions. So drivers go on strike. There are no drivers to deliver the concrete. Um, the concrete hardens at its, as it is sort of want to do. Um, the employer then turns around and sues the union under state tort law for the value of that hardened concrete. And the state court, you know, applies this, you know, nearly, you know, decades old precedent Garmin to do kind of exactly what state courts are supposed to do in these sorts of cases, which is to say, no, the right to strike is federally protected. You can't turn to state courts to try to gouge the union for exercising that right. Um, so state court does that, says, we don't want to hear this case, but the employer petitions the Supreme Court, gets the court to grant cert. Um, now, just for some context, this Garmin rule is kind of an integral part of the right to strike, right? Getting rid of Garmin allowing state court litigation over the value of a product that's damaged because workers stop working, that would kind of functionally gut the right to strike, right? Imagine, you know, farm worker strikes. Can they be sued for the value of the crop that goes fallow in the field? Or uh, grocery store employees strikes sued for the value of the milk that spoils because there's no one to shelve it. Um, if unions can be sued for the value of the product that's spoiled, it's impossible to strike, or at least it's impossible to strike at a time that would actually impact the employer. Um, so uh, the union, the Supreme Court sides eight to one against the union. We think that ruling was wrong for all sorts of reasons I'm happy to get into. But a kind of important silver lining here is that the court did not, despite calls from three of the justices, did not change that Garmin framework, right? Did not, it still said, you know, you can't sue someone just for stopping work. That would get the right to strike. It said on these facts, there was not, there was sort of enough to conclude that the union didn't obey some of the rules around striking. Um, so it was a, uh, a, a loss in a lot of ways, but a much narrower one. Than I think, uh, than I think some of the justices would have wanted, and that maybe was a fear going in. Do you think that they adopted the government's position in the case? So they were basically there were three parties arguing the case, right? You had Noel Francisco representing the company, then you had Solicitor General's office, uh, Vivek Suri without the notes. <laughs> and 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 then uh, you guys. Um, uh, so and and. You know, at some point, Justice Sotomayor basically told Mr. Suri, you know, tell us how to write this opinion. So tell me how to write this decision. <laughs> I'd suggest copying our brief, Your Honor. <laughs> <laughs> right, and he kind of summarized what he thinks, you know, the government's position is. So is, did they take that position or was it even closer to what you wanted them? So I, I think that they, in many respects, adopted the government's position. And there was a sort of funny moment in argument where uh, he says, I think you should just paste in our summary of the argument. <laughs> <laughs> Give it to me in a two paragraphs. Summary of the argument. Summary of the argument. <laughs> Um, and that's in two respects. The first is they left it open this kind of procedural question, which is, you know, by the time this case is getting started in state court, the NLRB, which is the federal agency tasked with kind of adjudicating these sorts of employer union disputes, had also started proceedings. And so the government sort of asked them to stay out of the question of how that impacts everything, right, regardless of whether state courts should step aside in a case in the abstract that's sort of within the jurisdiction of the NLRB. Surely if you've got parallel proceedings going, there's even more of a reason for the step, state court to step out of the fray. Um, and so... We thought that was an that we thought that was an easy question. We wanted the the court to weigh in on. Uh, the government sort of said, "Stay out of that question, court," and they stayed out of it. Um, and then the second way in which they sort of adopted the government's position is sort of narrowing in on kind of the specific facts of of this case. Um, but it was sort of striking to me in listening to the argument. You know, the court hasn't had a right to strike case in basically a generation, right? Right. Um, and it kind of shows, like even the kind of. Um, I think even some of the liberal justices weren't as um, 
attuned to the stakes here as they might be in other economic justice cases, right? So, you know, some signal they'd be open to a rule that distinguished between an ordinary strike and a strike that, quote, intends to destroy an employer's property, um, which sounds good, but in actuality, the line between I intend to strike at a moment where if the employer does not come to the bargaining table, it will lose property because that's how I use the strike to have leverage. And I intend to strike so the employer will lose property. That's a kind of razor yes. thin line. And requiring unions to fight over that line on pain of being liable for all the property destroyed would have a substantial chilling effect on the right to strike. Um, and I think as we sort of see this resurgence in the labor movement, right, writers, actors, auto workers out right. on strike right now, exercising their right to stop work. We're seeing a resurgence in union membership after basically a generation of unions in decline. I hope that we see some of that trickle back into the law, into kind of court's awareness of how work stoppages actually function. There, there also seem to be just um, the presence of old themes, though, right? That the N NLRB, like the, the essentially this... Uh, um, suspiciousness of the administrative state, right? Or like the federal jurisdiction, like that federal courts uh, should be like looking at it after reviewing the decision of the administrative board. Uh, and on the other side, you have state courts, right? And this idea of Justice Gorsuch is a big fan of like, why don't we just you know, let it all happen in state courts. Um, and, and it seemed like in that sense, so the, the, the strike aspect of it was novel, but some of the debates seem to be kind of very much uh, old. Uh, that's right. I mean, the ironic part, though, right, is that the state court here is the one that said, we don't want this case. We don't have the expertise to adjudicate it. Um, and they're reversing it. Yeah. Yes. Um, and so it's, it's, sort of a, it's a sort of funny forum for that battle to take place. But I think you're right. The three justices that concur, Justice Thomas, Justice Gorsuch and Justice Alito, um, did very much view this as the lens, not just of kind of you know, labor versus employer, which is one overlay, but also administrative state, state versus federal, all these other themes, kind of um, uh, even though this kind of Garmin rule we've described has been a sort of um, stable accommodation that actually, you know, like the Chamber of Commerce wrote a brief saying like, please don't touch Garmin, like it's kept labor peace, don't bring us back to the bad old days of um, strikes and open warfare. Like, uh, so even though this accommodation has proven really, really workable, um, uh, I think you're right that at least for a couple of the justices, this um, triggered a few sore spots. And it's interesting because a lot has been said about footnote battle between Jackson and Thomas in the affirmative action case. But you kind of have a footnote battle here too, right? So the majority, which is interesting to me, does not respond to Jackson's dissent at all. And I don't see too many cases where they just pretend the dissent is not happening. But then Thomas and Jackson kind of talk to each other. Oh, and Alito talks to Jackson, too, in, in a footnote. But uh, Justice Jackson, she uh, basically tells Thomas to leave the gar Garmin uh, hiatus alone. That's right, yeah. Um, th there is a lot. There's a, some, some kind of dialogue happening. There's also some sort of... Um, dialogue happening between the court and the Washington Supreme Court, right? Justice Alito has a footnote where he sort of says, yes. you adopt Justice Jackson's view on remand. I think we should grant again, which is a sort of um, uh, something I haven't seen. <laughs> seen yes, it's a bit of a threat, though I'm yeah. not sure he has the votes, but yeah. that was interesting. Yes. Yeah, yeah so there's definitely a, a lot of stuff uh, uh, going on in the background. But uh, talk a, a little bit more about Justice Jackson, because essentially she's going alone, right? And... Uh, very forcefully. Uh, it's a long dissent, you know, laying out the reasoning. Um, it, it's amazing that, you know, she, she is equipped to do this kind of stuff this early in her career. So uh, discuss it a little bit. Yeah, so uh, I thought this dissent was, was, was terrific, and not just because it pulls a lot of themes and reasoning directly from our brief, um, but also because she really kind of gets the stakes and I think lays them out really effectively. I think two things that are notable about this particular dissent. The first is um, she sort of shows her administrative law chops, right? She's, you know, um, Justice Breyer's heir apparent in a lot of different ways, but one way she sort of 
one thing she kind of brings to this dissent is this kind of historical perspective. Um, you know, at the time that the statute was passed, there were these doctrines around what's called primary jurisdiction. There were these kind of rules about routing things through administrative agencies that have kind of withered on the vine since then. Um, but because this statute was passed in an era where that was a sort of standard model of um, being a traffic cop between state courts and, frankly, federal courts and administrative agencies, she talks about how that historical perspective should inform our understanding of the statute, um, which, again, is sort of an administrative law deep dive, right? <laughs> many admin law scholars don't know a ton about that doctrine. We we, we had to do some real digging when we, we kind of put it in, into our brief. Um, and then I guess the, the second thing I'll just sort of say about her dissent is um, she's not afraid to um, talk about the kind of human and political stakes as well as the kind of, you know, she can kind of play in the majority's turf. She she does text, she does history, she does precedent. Mm -hmm. um, but she also has a kind of little bit of a, a, a rhetorical flourish that I think is um, really remarkable for a justice so junior in her career. Right. And um, the I was looking for the Alito's uh, footnote uh, where he engages with Jackson's dissent and he says the court wisely declines to address the argument on which Justice Jackson relies regarding the effect of the complaint before the NLRB on this litigation. If the state courts on remand dismiss this case on that ground, the decision, in my judgment, would be a good candidate for a quick return trip here. Well, it's in, it's in one justice's judgment, in my <laughs> judgment only. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, we'll see if there will be more union cases coming up before the Supreme Court. That'll be really, really interesting, given the current environment. Let's talk now about Dubin, the case that you, Jeff, uh, personally argued uh, last term. Um, and uh, how did it shake out for you? <laughs> <laughs> Happily good. Uh, so, so this case was about the federal aggravated identity theft statute, uh, which makes it a crime. And I'll just read the words here. Uh, so it's titled aggravated identity theft, but the actual words of the statute are um, it's, it, it's a crime to knowingly transfer, possess, or use without lawful authority a means of identification of another person uh, in the commission of a uh, of enumerated felony. The statute lists a variety of felonies. Uh, and it's an automatic two years in prison. Um, uh, for what you can think of as a mandatory minimum two years. It's a pretty powerful uh, tool for prosecutors, Which is, which is right? an extra pop, especially, you know, there are obviously are various crimes in the federal code that are punishable by a lot more than that. But this particular offense is usually coupled with felony uh, fraud charges that themselves don't require any time in prison. So the two years is quite meaningful. Um, if for, for plea bargaining and for ultimate sentencing. Uh, and so Dubin's the case is a good example of that. So, so David Dubin, who we represented in the case, um, uh, worked with his dad in a, uh, small healthcare company that provides psychological services. Uh, the government, uh, indicted David and his dad, uh, for in, in essence, uh, overbilling. Uh, and on the one particular count on which he was convicted, uh, he was, um, found guilty by a jury of charging about $500 uh, for, a, for a psychological evaluation for uh, somebody uh, uh, for, uh, for which it uh, should have charged uh, $380 or something like that. So it's a little over $100, uh, claiming that it was performed by a person with higher credentials than than, than in fact was the case is what the jury found. So he was convicted of healthcare fraud for that violation, uh, and uh, nobody's disputing that. Mm -hmm. uh, what the case was about was about the additional charge attached to that uh, healthcare fraud violation, which was a charge of aggravated identity theft. Which is hard to kind of wrap your head around in this right. factual so, scenario. So most of us have a intuitive conception of, of identity theft. It's when somebody gets our credit card number uh, that, uh, and goes out, you know, unbeknownst to us, goes out in the world and pretends to be us and buys themselves a new flat screen TV. And, <laughs> and then we get a call. You know, we, uh, uh, I've been through it. Probably other people have. Yes. And so, uh, so that's the standard case. But again, if you go to that language, it just talks about using someone's means of identification uh, in, in relation to the commission of a felony. And so the government read those words very broadly and said, well, when David Dubin submitted these healthcare bills to the government, they had a person's name on it, the patient. So he used the patient's name in the commission of this felony in relation to the felony and therefore also committed 
um, aggravated identity theft. And, and, and we said, well, wait a minute. No, that can't be right. Um, uh, this was his patient. It was his, He had permission to use this person's name uh, for billing. Right. He didn't steal anything. He didn't st- steal the identity. Uh, and the government responded to that by saying, well, no, he didn't have the permission to use her name in that way. <laughs> uh, uh, and so right. that's kind of the case that went up to the court. In essence, how broad is this statute and how broad are the words used in relation to? Um, and happily for us and our clients, as you suggested, uh, we got a 9-0 decision from the court uh, reading the statute narrowly and saying to uh, to use someone's name in the commission of a felony and thereby commit aggravated identity theft, uh, there has to be a tight connection between the use of the name uh, and, the, and the felony itself. And so it has to be sort of the crux of the crime is the misuse of the name, not just sort of an incidental use of a name while you're committing a felony. Um, and I think there's two interesting things about that decision. Once you get out of the, you know, the, the dictionaries and all <laughs> the, the rest. Right. Um, you know, uh, so there's, so one is just, we talked a little bit already a couple of times about methodology at the court and textualism, which is the ascendant methodology at the court. Dubin is the latest in a line of cases where I think the court is reading criminal statutes perhaps a little differently than it reads other statutes, and, and, and more particularly with a thumb on the scale towards reading them narrowly. Uh, the court says again and again and again, the plain text, the ordinary meaning of words is what controls statutory interpretation. Uh, but in Dubin, uh, a case a couple, a couple of years ago we handled called Van Buren, uh, various cases involving the uh, mail and wire fraud statutes, and maybe most most notoriously, a case called Yates involving uh, uh, the words tangible object in the Sarbanes-Oxley Act as applied to red snapper caught in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, the court has again and again not given the literal meaning of these big flabby words in criminal statutes, but has read them narrow. It, they explicitly say this, right? They say we cannot construe a criminal statute on the assumption that the government will use it responsibly. So they're kind of gesturing to this, like criminal statutes. And that gets to the really interesting thing. I mean, there's a strong libertarian flavor right. to that statement, right? right. Which is we're not going to uh, give the words the ordinary meaning because of distru- some level of you know unwillingness to trust the government all the way down the line. Um, and so, and that brings me to the second thing. Well, uh, many, many listeners may be saying to themselves, well, we've always had this rule. It's called the rule of lenity, which is if you have, if you have, um, if you have an ambiguous criminal statute because of the importance of giving fair notice to people about what is criminal and what isn't, um, uh, we're going to construe them narrowly in any you know, sort of ambigu- a- ambiguous situation. But the court has expressly renounced the rule of lenity as a whole. Now, Justice Gorsuch and Justice Sotomayor especially uh, have, have argued the court ought to be invoking the rule of lenity, but the court says, no, 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 we're not doing that. Uh, and Justice Kavanaugh has been even more specific in writing saying, absolutely, I reject the rule of lenity in all but the most, you know, the most narrow of situations. But in practice, it seems like that's sort of what the government, <laughs> I'm sorry, the government, <laughs> but the court, you know, the court yes. is, st- is doing. And so, you know, we can ask ourselves why the court is, um, is fighting over those labels. Um, but writ large, I think what you're seeing is a real trend, a meaningful trend over the last decade, maybe two, where the court is confronted again and again with broadly worded federal criminal statutes that read literally could have, as the court has said sometimes, breathtaking scope. And again and again, the court says, no, we're not going to give it the broadest possible meaning. We're going to we're going to narrow them up. Yeah, the, what is it that Justice Gorsuch writes a concurrence and he says, whoever among you is not an aggravated identity thief, let him cast the first stone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can imagine the discussions we had in the clinic uh, and with others that helped us prepare for the argument, coming up with all the hy- hypotheticals and, um, and, and imagining how broad the government's rule would really apply. And this, you know, if I can be so bold as to give the little pointer to the field, this seems to be the thing the court responds to again and again, is, is not so much pounding away at Westlaw to write a legal brief, but actually sitting back and thinking about the implications of the government's reading of a criminal statute. And if you can come up with implications that trouble the court and seem like overreach or, um, or, uh, or, uh, or just simply you know, unfair punishment, uh, the court seems to respond to that. During the oral argument, uh, the government was asked about uh, like one of the hypotheticals, and it was very much like rounding up, you know, a billable hour kind of thing, yeah. right? And basically said, would that f- fall within the statute? And, uh, uh, you know, Vivek Suri said, yes. 
very comfortably. And I think it was Justice Thomas who basically said, well, that just, you know, that sounds wrong and bad and he and and you know the response is like well maybe it does but that's what the text of the statute requires Mm -hmm. and it did seem like the court balked at it Uh, i'd like to see how far you will go with this Um, let's say the only uh allegation here involved the rounding up uh from 2.5 hours to three hours would that be sufficient to uh, violate this provision? Yes, Justice Thomas, and I appreciate that that may seem an unattractive result. Well, I think unattractive is, understate, is an understatement. <laughs> it is nevertheless the correct reading of the statute. Right, and, 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 and the contrast to my mind is how often that kind of response flies in other sorts of cases where you say the plain text of the statute is what it is, and usually Justice Gorsuch is the one leading that charge. Uh, and here he's taking, in a sense, the opposite position because he really sees the criminal cases as different, is what it seems to me. And what is Gorsuch's position here? Because he writes separately. And <laughs> <laughs> well, I will say that, uh, that I love Justice Gorsuch's concurrence. Um, uh, at least, you know, at, at least in tone and, and atmosphere, because he says, I would declare the statute unconstitutionally vague because it's so hard to make sense of the text. And as somebody who had to go through the pain of preparing for oral <laughs> argument in that case and imagining all the different hypotheticals that could arise, uh, there's a great deal of sympathy I have for Justice Gorsuch's position. And I'm not sure at the end of the day it isn't going to win out. You know, we mentioned the Armed Career Criminal Act earlier. Uh, And Justice Scalia started out as a lone voice in the wilderness saying, we're never going to be able to make sense of this thing. And the court tried and tried and tried for a decade and finally threw up its hands and say, unconstitutionally vague. Now, I'm not sure if the aggravated identity theft statute is going to be invoked as often uh, and be at the court's uh, docket as often as ACCA. Uh, but I do think uh, there's there's a, maybe a similar arc that is uh, that is that is out there to take place. So I'd say stay tuned on Justice Gorsuch's <laughs> perspective. <laughs> yeah, Justice Sotomayor kind of responds to him. I love this: uh, adrift in a blizzard of its own hypotheticals, <laughs> the concurrent be- believes that it's essentially vague. But but then she says it's kind of our job, you know, to like look at the text, and I'm doing it here, and it makes sense the way I'm doing it. And you know, everybody who is interested in the analysis of statutes, like, should read this opinion. Well, I think the the last thing I'll say is that I think what it really comes down to then is prosecutorial discretion. Uh, And is the government going to bring these these, uh, more questionable edge cases? Um, And if they do, then maybe the court's going to have, you know, a muscular response. If they don't, uh, then maybe, you know, then maybe the court has a different response. And so I think a lot of it... um, a lot of it's going to be decided by the behavior of local U.S. attorney offices and how, they, how aggressively they uh, use this statute uh, for charging and plea bargaining. Yeah, it's a clear signal that they shouldn't be overusing it. And they specifically mention the power of prosecutors to use the statute to strong arm somebody. Um, you mentioned oral arguments several times. So I'd like to you briefly tell us about your prep for this particular case, because you're right, they came at you with hypotheticals immediately. So how was the prep like? And uh, did it, you know, uh, did you feel sufficiently prepared for this case after that? <laughs> I don't know if I ever feel sufficiently prepared. <laughs> Just what happens is the morning of oral argument comes and comes you show up in a suit and, and you do it. Um, so you do your best to prepare. Uh, and this was a challenging case. I mean, the court always likes to ask hypotheticals of testing, you know, the broader rule that either side is proposing. And this case, as I suggested, was just really a challenge to sort through all the different permutations where somebody's name could be used while committing a crime. You, you just the mind goes in all kinds of different directions. So that made this a real challenge. Um, I think, but it was a challenge. But, but one thing I do is I remind myself, well, hey, it's a challenge for both sides. Uh, so something that's always nice about oral argument day, once you get over the nerves and all the rest, is for most people, the preparation of a week or two leading up to argument is all about having to face up to all the shortcomings uh, and difficulties of their own argument. And at the end of the day, you don't have to have a perfect argument. You just have to have a better argument than the other side. (laughs) Uh, And I think that's what we achieved in Dubin. Uh, So it was really rewarding. We had the students uh, are remarkable uh, in helping us prepare and do, in my my personal system, as I always do at least two moots, uh, to push myself through uh, just articulating my position and being ready to answer the hard questions. So, uh, so everybody got me ready, and uh, and and maybe you know 
I'll just say, I think yeah. this was a case where, where the court's new format for oral argument um, really might have made a difference uh, because we had a few different lines of approach in this case, and we didn't actually get to uh, the argument that ultimately carried the day on the, on the nitty-gritty text of the statute until very near the end of my time at the podium. The Michael for, case, right? Yes. Well, the, well, you know, just, yes, and the focus on the word use in a particular way. Yeah. Um, who, and, yeah. And, uh, but because they have this new one-by-one -one questioning that kicks in after the 25 or so minutes, uh, we had another 20 or 25 minutes, I can't remember exactly how long I was up there, to explore that argument and to lay it out. And I, and I, and I, and I wonder whether if I hadn't had that extra time, uh, whether you know the justices you know might have gone in a different direction or might have thought about the case differently, and I think it was a great example why I think a lot of advocates really like this new um, this new system the court has this hybrid system as I call it from from the pre-COVID days and the COVID days, and why the court itself I think benefits from it. Yeah, in the oral argument, essentially you ran out of time, and then it, it started the the seriatim questioning, right? And it's Justice Roberts who asked you the first question, and you almost like may I finish because your time is essentially the original time is out, and he's like, of course, of course, go ahead, you know, <laughs> very much with this idea of like we actually have all the time in the world now for you know for you to answer questions that every one of the justices will have. Yeah, and yeah. it just shows, it's heartening because it shows that oral argument can really be productive and meaningful in the court. Uh, you know, I'm not trying to pat myself on the back in this case, but in general, I think this new system is sort of best designed to help the court. Help uh, think through. Help them think through yeah. it and help each justice really get his or her questions answered as best they can. And from the, the advocate's perspective, that's all you can ask for is that kind of uh, engagement. And I think it's... Um, uh, so it makes argument maybe even marginally more important in the current court, uh, or at least more of a, uh, a possibility where you can move the ball. Uh, and, you know, that stands in contrast. When I was a law clerk and Chief Justice Rehnquist was, was presiding, you know, the joke was that he'd interrupt a lawyer in the middle of the word the uh, <laughs> when, your, when your red light went on. So, um, uh, so this new system, I think, is working really well as long as the court doesn't go, prob you know, uh, too open-ended on the on the one by one questioning, but I think it's been useful for the court. Yeah, that's that's a very interesting and useful perspective. Yeah, an opportunity for court to actually think through it rather than oral argument being a merely performative thing. Right. You know, it's kind of like uh, Justice Thomas used to say: the reason he's not asking questions is because he just wants to give an advocate like spotlight. You know. 20 minutes or 30 minutes to like get it out of their system and sit down, you know, but now it's not that. Now it's actually, I'm thinking through this, can you help me? Right, and, and just my own perspective is, I don't wanna give a 20 or 30 minute speech. I mean, I've done <laughs> right. that in my brief. So right. I want the questions, but I also want time to answer them. And I want them to have time to follow up if by, my answer doesn't quite satisfy them. And that's what the new system gives you, is a real opportunity for actual engagement, rather than getting a question that's really hard, getting two sentences out, and then you're interrupted from somebody else and you never get back to it. Yeah, and then your time is up, counsel. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Speaking of uh, prosecu prosecutors, Isha, uh, let's now transition to a petition that you guys filed. Um, and uh, tell us more about that prosecutor case. Sure. Um, so this is the case I alluded to at the top of this podcast where we're collaborating with the Institute for Justice. Uh, it's a case called Chevron versus City of Napoleon. Uh, and this one's near and dear to my heart because in my prior role at the MacArthur Justice Center, I often was involved in cases where the police lied about my client committing a crime. And because of that lie, my client was harmed, right? They were arrested. They were kept in jail. Their property was seized. And the question in Cheverini is this. Let's say the police are telling the truth about some crimes that my client committed, but not about all of them, right? And this matters because, you know, frankly, there are so many criminal laws in this day and age that almost all of us are constantly committing crimes of some sort, right? Jaywalking, favorite right. example of right. everyone's. Yeah, so, so let's say the police say, right, this guy, he jaywalked and he tried to kill a police officer. They're telling the truth about the jaywalking, they're lying about the attempted murder. In most circuits, you can still sue the police. They lied about the attempted murder. Who cares if they're telling the truth about the jaywalking? On the Sixth Circuit, so long as they're not lying about the jaywalking, you can't sue for the fact that they made up the attempted murder. So in this case, our client, Yasha Shevarini, he owns a jewelry store. He buys some jewelry that turns out to be stolen. 
And the police officers have a little bit of a vendetta against him, right? Among other things, one of the police officers in this case owns a rival jewelry store. Um, they're kind of furious because Mr. Chevrini, you know, wants to consult a lawyer before he hands over this jewelry to the police. Um, so they swear out a probable cause affidavit that leads to a warrant um, where they claim he violated a licensing requirement, right? That's an infraction. He received stolen property. That's a misdemeanor. Um, and that he committed money laundering, which is a serious felony. And they're able to arrest him, jail him, confiscate tons of store property, including jewelry. Um, and because of that kind of that money laundering charge, which actually has winds up to have no basis in fact or law, um, much more serious than the other two, his reputation, which is you know, really critical if you're a jeweler, right? Brokers have to entrust you with diamonds and gems. His reputation is totally ruined. But the Sixth Circuit says, who cares? There's cause to believe that he committed, you know, the, that licensing violation, that minor infraction. So it doesn't matter if the cops were lying about the money laundering charge, the massive felony. So we're asking the Supreme Court to grant cert, not just because this is terrible policy and kind of contrary to all sorts of common sense notions of justice. Um, it's also inconsistent with the kind of historical law of tort, which is the backdrop to these sorts of civil rights questions. So... Um, uh, as Chief Judge William Pryor, who is the chief judge of the 11th Circuit, no kind of liberal squish when it comes to policing <laughs> issues, um, he wrote an opinion where he sort of lays out the history and explains, like, at common law, the backdrop against which Section 1983 is passed. Um, that was never the way it works. It was not enough to say there's probable cause to, as to one offense. So it doesn't matter if you lied about others. Um, and again, we're proud to have uh, the support from, you know, no lesser lights than the folks at the Institute of Justice <laughs> on this one, supporting us and asking the court to take up this issue. A uh, shout out to Marie Miller, who wrote the amicus brief. Marie Miller. Um, <laughs> uh, so um, you mentioned at the beginning of the podcast that uh, you are very judicious about what issues to petition on, right? So what is it about this case that made you think, you know what, this is worth yeah, so I think that there were two things for us. The first is, is frankly, the chief judge prior opinion. Um, you know, if anyone is going to have scorched the historical record and made sure that it's on one side of an issue, it's chief judge Bill Pryor. Um, and so when he wrote this opinion, kind of laying out that history, we sort of thought to ourselves, well, OK, this this is the sort of ascendant methodology at the court. And we've got one of the foremost practitioners saying this is the way it works. And the second is, you know, everyone we've talked to, no matter their political priors, when you tell them that, right, jaywalking, attempted murder, as long as you've got the jaywalking, doesn't matter about the attempted murder, there's just this intuition like that can't possibly be right. And so for the reasons that Jeff was talking about with the Dubin case, I actually think that intuition, regardless of the kind of methodology that the court is engaging in, I think that intuition often carries some force. Yeah, and Dubin and Chiaverini or she have how do you say it? Chevrini, yeah. Chevrini. Dubin and Chevrini. They, they really do have that same theme. Um, and, and also this idea of prosecutors having these tools that they can use that, you know, um, uh, are very problematic. All right. And the last thing that we want to talk about today is the uh, merits case that you guys will be arguing. And you said uh, Pam Carlin uh, will be uh, doing the oral argument in that case. Uh, so can you tell us about Garnier? Right. So Garnier is uh, actually uh, one of two cases the court has granted to explore how the state action doctrine applies to public officials who have their own uh, uh, Facebook, or I'll say Twitter. I know it's X, but I'm just going to say Twitter <laughs> Until accounts. you can't. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and the like. Um, and so, uh, so we represent a couple uh, from, uh, from the San Diego area who were uh, uh, going on the website or the uh, social media accounts of uh, two school board officials uh, who are elected, school, elected public officials. Um, and I'll talk about the two of them as if they're one, just to make mm -hmm. things simpler. Uh, but there are things like the official seal of the of the of, of the of their position and the official the official um, uh, you know the official Facebook site of you know representative so and so uh, and and for the, for the for the listeners this might sound like a familiar setup if it makes it easy for you to uh, conceptualize this uh, you know our former president Donald Trump <laughs> had his own Twitter account. Uh, that uh, that became the subject of a First Amendment lawsuit while he was in office. Um, uh, the Second Circuit held that 
uh, that his, uh, his use of that account, in fact, was state action. Uh, but uh, by the time the case went to the U.S. Supreme Court, he was no longer the president. And so the court uh, d- essentially dismissed the case. Uh, and so, and so this is you know from the president now to the local school board official. In some sense, it's the same issue. Yep. Um, uh, you know, uh, if you're using uh, your personal account, but uh, but but while you're doing your job and interacting with your constituents, are you a state actor and thereby subject most immediately to the First Amendment uh, and any other constitutional restriction that might be come into play? Um, and the Ninth Circuit in this case held yes, they were state actors. And they violated the First Amendment by blocking the Garniers from their website uh, because uh, uh, because they had a right, just like any other constituent, to post comments and feedback um, and, and, and uh, you know about policy issues on the on the website. Um, so the the arguments as they go to the court uh, are uh, from the from the school board from the from the officials. They say unless we are under a duty to have these sites, unless we're doing it. Um, uh, you know, as, as literally part of our job description uh, that we're required to run these kind of social media platforms, um, uh, we are not state actors, and therefore we can do anything we want on these, webs- on, on these sites. Um, you know, we say, no, the test shouldn't be that strict. You shouldn't be under a duty to be doing social media as long as you, in effect, are doing your job by interacting your constituents in this manner, this modern way in which... Um, in which uh, p- political off- officers uh, interact with their constituents, uh, you are a state actor. Uh, and so there's a couple of interesting things maybe to watch here. I mean, this is another case where I anticipate the argument's going to be like a blizzard of hypotheticals. <laughs> uh, you know, the other side says, well, what if you're having a backyard barbecue and you happen to be talking about right. uh, uh, your job? Uh, does that mean that you can't exclude anybody from your backyard? And we say, no, 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 that's private property. That's, you know, that's... That's in all yeah. likelihood going to be different. This is a public-facing, open-to-all uh, platform, you know, for interaction. So it's more like a town hall meeting with everybody invited, uh, and and no more can you cancel con- particular constituents. And you could say, you know, no black people are allowed to come, or no Jewish people are allowed to come, or whatever else, because that would um, that would transgress other constitutional boundaries. Um, and the other thing that's int- uh, uh, that's interesting about the case. Uh, is that for all the court's decisions over the years about the line of the state actor doctrine, who is a state actor, they're virtually all about private individuals being uh, right. transformed into Like state private actors, prisons, for example. For example, yes. Uh, or, or others who contract with the government to carry out governmental services of all kinds. Mm-hmm. You know, when, do, when do they become state actors? Blackwater. Uh, this is the inverse. This is somebody who's unquestionably a public official um, uh, arguing that, oh, because I'm acting in my private capacity somehow, right. uh, in my personal capacity, I'm no longer a state actor. And again, we don't dispute that if somebody has their own private page to say, here's a, my grandkid's birthday party, here's our trip to Hawaii last week, uh, obviously they don't have a First Amendment constraints on that activity. Uh, but they do have constraints that kick in when they're, as we put it, doing their job of interacting with constituents, uh, soliciting views on policy issues, posting safety protocols for the schools, as they were doing in this case, for example, all those sorts of things, under the auspices of saying, this is the official side of me as a, of a uh, school board official. So we think that's, um, that, that makes things different. Yeah, uh, you brought up Donald Trump, so I'm going to br- bring up Mark Meadows. <laughs> so well, big, big thing with Mark Meadows is he's making a similar argument uh, about why the case should be removed to federal court, right? Where he's basically saying, I was not campaigning as a chief um, when, when we were talking about Georgia electors, right? I was actually working as a chief of staff when we're talking about gen- uh, Georgia electors. And the same thing here when they're saying, oh, we were, you know, we also using this account to campaign, uh, not just to do our job. So, uh, you know, therefore, we actually are not engaging in it as officials. And he's arguing the opposite. He actually right. wants to. Uh, so could you comment a little bit on that to kind of bring the relevance? Well, I'm not deep in the weeds of the Meadows situation, but I think you're right in what you describe. Certainly in this case, the um, uh, the other side is saying uh, campaigning is private activity and some of what we were doing was campaigning. 
to some degree, that probably comes down to a factual question of just looking at these, um, at the content of these uh, uh, these accounts. Right. Uh, and I think it's probably right that um, that campaigning, certainly before you hold office, and maybe even when you hold office, in some ways can be thought of as personal activity. Uh, but we don't think that's really what's going on here insofar as you can distinguish one from the other when it comes to a uh, elected official. Uh, is there a circuit split on this issue? Well, there, they said yes in the petition. Uh, we said maybe not so much in our brief in opposition. Um, the court took the case. In a sense, it doesn't matter anymore whether there's a circuit right. split. But, but, but it's fair to say there's at least been different legal tests that have been announced by different courts. Uh, and whether they cash out to different results was debated at the search stage, and um, it may not matter so much anymore. But the difference between the tests being given to the court right now are that the other side says, unless your job requires you to have this Facebook account and Twitter account and to do, you know, to say certain things on it, then, uh, then you're not a state actor um, not in any way, shape, or form. The last thing that we say is that uh, in some ways it's kind of an odd uh, way for the court to dip its toes into this area. Because I don't think anyone disputes, and we're having this conversation right now, it doesn't take you very long that you start to have hard questions in your head about yeah. where lines should be drawn. Right. But the real question is, are those First Amendment questions or are those state action questions? Right. And for us, the state action question should be pretty easy. As I said, the court has never held that a public official doing their job is not a state actor. And that's right. just all that's going on here. Now, you can debate the First Amendment rules that ought to apply in this situation, you know, certainly a disruptive, um, you know, you could have a, 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 a you know, disruptive, uh, uh, expletive laden, uh, you know, posts might be able to be deleted right. in certain circumstances, perhaps, um, you know, perhaps there are other time, place and manner restrictions that could be imply, you know, imposed. Those are all First Amendment questions, uh, but none Not of the, the First Amendment questions, questions are in front of the court, so only the state action question. Yeah, and you make that argument uh, that essentially it's a pig in a poke a little bit, what they did, which is they, they asked cert to be granted on the threshold question, and now they're arguing these other complicated First Amendment questions, right? And uh, the, 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 sort of, uh, the question is whether, whether the court should even reach those questions rather than simply answer the threshold question. Right, and I don't want to characterize the other side our uh, intent at all and much not even their arguments necessarily. I, I, I think that what I would just say about our view is the court should answer the state action question alone because that's the only issue in front of it, the only legal issue in front of it. And insofar as the other side makes arguments that, you know, if they're state actors, then they're unable to do all these things with their platforms and all the rest. You know, that doesn't necessarily follow. It skips over the First Amendment question or whatever other constitutional question would be there as a substantive matter. And that could be where the real action is um, if you're troubled by any of those hypotheticals the other side gives. Uh, let me just ask you one last question, and it's related to a case that IJ had, uh, and it's about the state action part of it, not First Amendment part of it. Um, we had um, this... Um, County engineer who didn't like uh, a truck company and decided to essentially uh, retaliate against them. Uh, and he did it by uh, using his company truck and acting as a cop, not as a county engineer, and stopping them on a highway. And uh, th 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 there are several questions. One question is actually whether qualified immunity uh, should be granted to somebody who is acting outside of the scope of their employment. But the other question is that whether it's a state action in the first place, because he is not acting as a, he, he's not acting as a county engineer. He's not acting as what his job tells him to do, but he is still using the power of the state and stops the trucks essentially as a cop. So how would you think through that kind of a problem in light of what you're arguing in this case? Well, the court has always said that, uh, that somebody using the power of their public position to, uh, to act on the citizenry, whether it be by arresting somebody, 
uh, or harassing them or whatever else, uh, is still a state actor. So it's never been a defense all the way back to the Screws decision almost 100 years ago to say, you know, that sheriff was acting beyond his responsibilities. If he was using the power of his office to do what he did uh, and his badge and his authority and whatever else, then he's a state actor. And that's that's just core Section 1983 law. And we think it helps answer the question here again, which is when the other side says, was the person required by their job to Right. Do this. Right. We're like, so what? Uh, it just it doesn't exactly. matter. Um, it just matters uh, whether they're putting themselves out there and interacting with the public as the public official. Well, that's a great point of agreement to end on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, best- Always happy to support your arguments. <laughs> Best of luck with all that you have going on. Uh, We'll be watching and maybe we'll uh, do this again at some point in the future and uh, when you have seven petitions and, (laughs) uh, you know, 17 cases before the court. Thanks so much, Jeff. And thank you, Isha, for being here. Um, And thank you for listening. Thanks so much.